At one time, all of the continents that, that we know today were all connected at one time. And this hill rose up out of the waters and remained up out of the waters. However, good, very good, okay. This became the center of this hill. It became the very top of the hill. This part in this area here was the area that has received over millions of years the most amount of sunlight. And because it has received the most amount of sunlight, much of everything that exists, from plants to animals to everything that exists on even the dog comes from Africa. Plants come from Africa. Minerals come from Africa. Because of the nature of the relationship of the sun to this hill. Now, what becomes important about this hill, I want you to focus on this area here. Because this is the area that has received most of the sunlight for the millions of years. Now, what's going to happen over more millions of years, life forms are going to come, things are going to occur, but... One of the important things that is going to occur is the fact that there's going to come This is the map that we should have in our classrooms. The Mercator map that we use in most of our classrooms and that we use in general were developed through mercantilism. It, it, it was a, another form of a map, of an ancient map, Bidilis, that came from Africa. But the Mercator map is the map that we use in our classrooms. Most of the maps that you see look like that. However, there was a man by the name of Arnold Peters who was commissioned to, he was a cartographer. Cartographer is somebody who studies maps. He draws maps. And what he developed was another map, but this map was done by the research done by spaceships from outer space that took pictures of what the Earth actually looks like, what the continents actually look like. It's called fidelity. It means that you're accurate. The Mercator map is not accurate. It does not show Africa for its true size. It doesn't show. After these continents, remember Pangaea, after these continents separated, because remember, Pangaea will show you that they're all connected. But because of volcanoes and other things that happened in this hill, they began to separate. And then part of them separated, they became islands and all the other things that we have. One day in California, in the United States, in California, I tell people all the time, if you have friends in Los Angeles, one day Los Angeles is going to be an island. The westernmost part of California is one day going to eventually break away from continental United States. So get ready for it. And that's how the Caribbean islands came into existence. This actually shows you that Africa is much larger as it relates to its actual size. There is a, when we deal with Kush and Kemet, you're dealing with, this is the, this section of Africa here. Right there. It's called the Rift Valley, R-I-F-T. Valley. Rift Valley. It starts in Mozambique, comes up through Tanzania, up through Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Sudan, comes up across, goes into the uh, Red Sea, and into what we today call Israel. Yesterday we called Israel Palestine. The day before yesterday we called it Canaan, which was a black land. Inside of this Rift Valley, you have another valley, which is called the Hopi Valley, or the Nile Valley. 
Inside the Hapi Valley, you have what we call the Nile River, which is going to become a pathway for the family to be able to move once they come to where they're going to be. Over time, over time in this area, remember the Rift Valley comes up right through here, Uganda, you're going to have uh, Kenya, Tanzania, you're going to have many different forms of human beings. And in the foothills of, of these mountains of Tanzania and Uganda, you're going to have different forms of activity. Now, I'm not speaking from a religious perspective. I'm speaking straight up science. Because sometimes religion gets in the way of interpreting what actually happened. So that in this area here, the Great Lakes region, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, in East Africa, there is only one race on our planet. That's the human race. And that human race was conceived, and born, nurtured, educated, sustained in Africa. And when they got their show together, then they took it on the road. So it becomes important that we understand there is only one race, and that's the human race. And every human, no matter if they're in Holland, or if they're in Germany, or Japan, China, the United States, everybody, if you backtrack your family, lineage, all of us, even if you're from Ghana and Nigeria, that's not where you're originally from, your people traveled west from this area. And I'm going to show you a map that's going to designate exactly how Africans moved out of this valley area into other parts. Another uh, form of the Peter's projection map that shows the various countries. These countries didn't exist before 1885 in the Berlin Conference. Here is the movement of Africans that are going to find themselves moving up out. They're going to travel in all this area here. This is where they're from. Remember this now. Remember Pangea and remember what I showed you. This is where the sun was shining brightest on the top of that hill. So I want you to remember that because this is where everything is going to come up out of this area here. Now, in science, I'll give you three laws. Because, you see, when you come in and discuss this with folk, you've got to be very scientific with them, because they're going to try to blow you out the water. There's a law called Glozier's Law. G-L-O-G-E-R, apostrophe S. Glozier. There is Bergman's Law. B-E-R-G-M-A-N. And there's Allen's Law. A-L-L-E-N. These three laws show scientifically how, first and foremost, the original human beings would have had to have been well melanated, would have to have been very dark in complexion. How their bodies would have been formed, and why their bodies would have done what they did in terms of the length of arms and limbs and things like that. This is science. This is not personal. Science has already proven this now. The problem is, is they still don't want to put it in the books. But science is here. We already know this. And we have to get to a point where we're not going to argue this anymore because there's too much that we have to do. And we'll talk about that these next couple of days because there are certain things that, that we just got to get to to understand what it is that we have to do now specifically for our community, but, but intentionally for our children. The time I spent with those young people this morning was just phenomenal. They're ready. Our children are ready. I've spent, for those that may know, may not know, I spent my life in education in Bronx, New York. I, I retired from education in July of 2009 after 31 years with our children. I'm an early childhood licensed teacher. I taught five-year-olds and six-year-olds. Can you imagine that? <laughs> sitting on the floor, reading books, and just... I could write a book on my experiences with children that came to me and said, you look like my daddy? Can I call you daddy? 
I wish you were my daddy. To which my answer was, I am your daddy. <laughs> because it is an African tradition that every elder in the community is Baba. And every elder female is Mama. And although I didn't bring you in biologically, I am responsible for you once you're in my presence. And if we're concerned about what's happening to our children, no, I, I know, I'm not going to say here, but I know in places I go, New York, people always are wondering, they say, what's wrong with the children? I carry this with me just for when they ask me that question. You see this? It's a mirror. So when adults say, what's wrong with the children? I bring the mirror out and say, this is what's wrong with look. Because we have to take that full responsibility for our children. We have to take responsibility for our children, and we have to educate them. And we have to put ourselves and take our energy, because we know what's happening. We know what's happening. We see what's happening. And I'm speaking for New York. I don't disrespect places I visit. But if what I'm saying sounds right, then you know what I'm saying, too. But in New York City, the Board of Education is not failing our children. In fact, they're succeeding in their purpose. Because their purpose is to miseducate our children. We are not doing what we should be doing. And this is why I visit communities here and in other places to share this information, because this is what our children need to see. From my experiences, this is what... When they see things like this, this is what takes them to the next level. And we just have to get to the point where we get bold enough, strong enough, brave enough to be willing to face this. So the area there where the south, uh, what's the name of the What's the name of it? Well, this, a, this area is called the Great Lakes. This area here is called the Great Lakes region. Okay. Okay, it's called the Great Lakes region. Now, the Great Lakes region is an area that comprises basically three, maybe four countries. Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania. But the origin of the human family includes parts of Uganda, Burundi, Rwanda, Congo, and Southern Africa. Science has seen this. In fact, last year, they came up with, they found bones that in southern Africa that pushed the human family back another million years. When we start doing our own research, we're going to take our family back millions and millions of years. We've been around a lot longer than what these books are telling us. And every year brings new information. Let me tell you something else. Here's how interesting uh, research is in this area. Two years ago, I did a lesson plan on the Laetoli footsteps that was found in East Africa. These are footprints that were found of a human being and his family that was walking across an area that had a volcano. Volcanic ash was left in the ground. And because of that, after the volcanic ash had dried and everything else, this family was moving across. These footsteps were found. And what they said was, these individuals in Africa had to have lived a certain amount of millions of years ago. But the only thing is that the new technology now can measure the way the footprint is. So this new footprint can detect whether the person was walking hunched over or if they were walking erect. Okay, new technology can do this. The date that they gave these Laotoli footsteps were of a human family that was walking bent over which brought them back millions of years. But this new technology has shown that they were walking erect, the way in which the footstep was measured. If that be true, you've got to take the whole human family back more than 20 million years, if that be true, because of that scientific understanding. We now have to take the human family back millions of more years, which means that African and African people, the original African people, have been around much longer than what science is telling us. And this is science, which also tells us 
that the technological age of Africa has to go back also. Which means that pyramid builders and temple builders and the builders of all of the wonderful things have to go back the same amount of time. Everything got to go back in time. We have been great longer than they're willing to let us know. This is just science. They don't invite me places. Because I don't get emotional. See, we have to stop getting emotional about this. Sometimes you get very emotional because we do. And I can understand why we do. But when we get emotional about it, it knocks us off our game. But when I put my evidence up on the table, when I show these types of different types of scientific information, I know they don't have a leg to stand on in our discussion because you've got to show me that you've done your research too. And if you don't, then I win by forfeit because you're not prepared to deal with this conversation. So we have to get very scientific, don't get personal, don't get emotional, just deal with the facts because the facts will set you free. They're here. This is the Kushite kingdom. Remember, the, the, the origin of life is going to be in the Great Lakes region. It's going to be in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Congo, Southern Africa. That's where the human family was born. But over millions of years, this human family began to develop concepts and ideas. And they moved from developing these concepts into certain fundamental understandings of their echo logic. Echology. Echology. The study of your environment. See, we're all talking about economy. The echonomy means to know your home. Economics ain't got nothing to do with money. Now, we trade in money, and so much of what we want deals with money. But that's not what money is. Money is a vehicle. But economy means to know your environment. Echo is a Greek word. It comes from oikos. O-I-K-O-S. Even though the Greek language don't exist, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> it, it doesn't exist. The Rosetta Stone that they say has three levels of language on the top, they say, is Meduneta, then Heratic, and then they say, this is Classical Greek. This isn't Classical Greek. This is another African language that the Greeks adapted. There's a book called The, the Historical Origins of Christianity by Walter Williams, where he shows you the alphabet from Meduneta, hieroglyphs, to Heratic, to Greek, to Roman, so what does that say? You all, Dutch doesn't have a language. Dutch is not a language. To have a language, you must have your own personal script that goes with that language. English is not a language. Spanish is not a language. <coughs> German is not a language. They all use what they call Greek script. Make sense? Like, uh, bless you. Right? What does blessing mean? Blessing. What does it mean? Ain't I speaking your language? Yeah. Oh, okay. I just want to make sure. Because uh, sister, sister Ruth and I have been saying blessing for a while, and I want to make sure. But, but what does it basically mean to you? Like what? Blessing. Greetings, right? But the way I would say it is hello, right? Now, hello is H-E-L-L-O, but you have those same letters in the Dutch alphabet, right? But it's the way in which you rearrange your letters that creates your language. But it's the same script, and it's the Greek script. But wait a minute. I just told you that Greek script don't exist. And that Greek script actually is a contorted African script. So then I must also be telling you that when you write Dutch, you're writing an African script. 
Look, family, the only thing that Europeans invented was the patent office. Because they took everybody else's idea and put their name on it. They haven't invented anything. They may have twisted it, taken it to another level, but they didn't invent anything. We are the masters of this planet. And we share our knowledge with anybody and everybody who was willing to accept it. We just shared it with a group of wrong people at some point in history that didn't know how to appreciate the master teacher. But this is our history. This is as much your history as it is my history. And it's important that we understand these concepts. So, with what we know right now, with, with what I've spoken to you about right now, what I want to do is I want to take you back to the human family. some point in time, this age of the fishes blossomed and with the different types of entities and animals or fish that were in the water, and with the rising of water and coming down, there came a point in time where some of the fish that were too close to the land ended up being pushed up on the land and the water went down. Fish have gills. But these fish had to learn how to survive out of water. So over millions of years, some of them died, but some of them began to convert their gills that are outside into lungs which are on the inside. That brought forward the age of the amphibians, which are both land and water animals. Then these amphibians, some of them returned back into the water, some of them stayed out all the time. These amphibians that stayed out of the water all the time became reptiles. And that's when you had the age of the reptiles. Now reptiles laid their eggs outside. Mother would take care of them or whatever it was. But pretty soon there were some of the reptiles that began to, instead of laying eggs on the outside, over millions of years, their eggs were fertilized on the inside. That brought forward the age of the mammals. And the age of the mammals would go through its processes. And through these processes, they then would go through an understanding of the development of us as a people. Now, I know some of us have a problem with the idea of evolving from the ape. Science, we didn't evolve from the ape. But the ape and the human have a common ancestor. 99.9% .9 of what apes have, where they have it, humans have it the same place. Bone for bone, muscle for muscle, apes and humans are the same. Let's cry our river, build our bridge, but let's get over it. <laughs> because ape told me, what made you think I want to be identified with you? Look how y'all act. So that science has shown us, no matter how we look at it, bone for bone, muscle for muscle, the only real difference between an ape and a human is that in our brain you have, a, you have 12 melanated sites in your brain stem. There is one very important one that's known as the locus coeruleus, L-O-C-U-S. C-O-E-R-E-E-U-L-U-S. Corelius. C-O-E-R-E-L-E-U-S. Locus Corelius. It means black dot. And it sits right behind your pineal gland. 
And there's a relationship between the locus coeruleus, your pineal gland, and the sunlight that comes through the front of your head. Stick a pen, we're going to come back to that. But the point that I'm making is that there's more melanin in a human locus coeruleus than in an ape's locus coeruleus. There's so many differences. Apes now, they found apes that can communicate. That have the abilities to, to have a language. It's not like our language, but it's a language. And there is a belief that during this age of the mammal, that there was in the trees where the ape was living, it is believed that uh, for whatever reason, Groups of that ape, some people call it Ramapithecus, R-A-M-I-P-I-T-H-E-C-U-S, Ramapithecus, R-A-M-I-P-I-T-H-E-C-U-S. You know, it's good you're taking notes because first family, let me tell you something, don't believe a word I say. I'm not here for you to believe me. I just want to make us think. I, I want to give you another perspective. So if what I'm saying at times may rub you the wrong way or it might make you feel a little uncomfortable, that's good. We need to be uncomfortable. Because we walk in the okie doke out here. We're letting them just tell us anything about us, about them, and we believe it. Power is the ability to define someone else's reality and have that person accept that definition as if it were their own. People have been defining us for too long. And it's time that, that we start thinking. And when we start thinking, then we have other options as it relates to how we're going to deal with this issue and what we're going to do with our children. A group of Ramapithecus are going to come down onto the land for whatever reason. The others are going to remain up in the trees. As you know, apes have opposable thumbs in their hands and opposable big toes. So they can use their hands and their feet the same way. They're up in the trees. They're in their habitat. They're in what can do that. However, when that Rhymopithecus came down on the ground, all of a sudden, this big toe that was opposable got in its way. So what it used to do is, and science shows over the years how this started happening, where they would push their foot up so that they could walk and not step on their big toe. They kept doing it until nature has it so that if there's an imperfection around what it is that you're doing, Nature will have you born without that imperfection. So pretty soon, what was this big toe that was opposable became stationary. And that's why our toes look like that. And when we walked, when we were in the trees, we had 100% mobility. I mean, we could move feet, hands, just, you know, that Tarzan look kind of thing. Just move through. That's 100% mobility. You have a lot of mobility. However, those that came down on the ground lost that ability to use their feet the way they use their hands. So they lost 50% mobility. But they gained 50% stability. So they could walk with no problem, stable, but what did that do? That freed up their hands. Which is now going to move into another concept which we're going to get into. The first human family that is believed to have been on a planet in Africa Australopithecus robustus. I'm going to take it 
slow. AUS TRO LO PI TH ECUS Australopithecus. I don't know if you can see it that well here. But. See, here's where you have um, Artipithecus, Ramidus, Australopithecus. They have a lot of different names. The, the research I'm using is Dr. Sheikh Anta Diop's book, Civilizational Barbarism. Australopithecus robustus, R-O-B-U-S-T-U-S. -U -S. Australopithecus robustus means robust. It's a very thick human, heavy bone. And it's going to lean over when it walks. Okay, it's, it's still hunched over. Australo means southern. Australopithecus robustus, robust. Big, thick. From Australopithecus robustus, Australopithecus robustus is going to live, act, eat, think. I want to ask you a question. Uh, if all these closed, and if all the places that you got your food closed, if every place that you go around that you get food closed, my question to you is, could you eat dinner? The reason why I'm telling you this is because in the Bronx, in the city, projects, cement, concrete, there were two sisters that had a little home in the Bronx. They had a backyard, and they grew cucumbers and tomatoes and fruits like that, foods like that. You have a, a man that works down on Wall Street has millions of dollars. But if the stores where you buy food close, no matter how much money that man had, he can't eat. And even though these two sisters had that little home with the yard in the back, could eat, they could survive. So if you have power, it means that you have a yard somewhere that you're growing food. You have a garden somewhere that you grow food. So then when we're thinking about economics and we're thinking about moving into the future, one of the things we've got to get back into is into the land, back into nature. We have to start growing our own food. We have to teach our children gardening techniques. Think about what I'm saying. These are very real things. We're all trying out here trying to get that money, trying to get them euros. I understand. I'm trying to get them too. <coughs> but the bottom line is, is that you, although money is green, you can't eat it. It don't make a difference. That's why I say economics is not about money. It's about knowing your environment. The point that I'm making is that these early humans made advances in agriculture. That's what I'm saying. What, what allowed the human family to grow was the advances in agriculture. Orsonopithecus robustus ate better. When robustus ate better, they thought better. When they thought better, they ate better. When they ate better, they thought. So the cycle of thinking and agricultural science becomes very important and the cornerstone to moving the human family forward. So Orsonopithecus robustus then lived a lifestyle that made it shed some of its heavier thickness and Australopithecus robustus became Australopithecus gracile, G-R-A-C-I-L-E, gracile. From robustus to gracile, G-R-A-C-I-L-E. Just a slender human being. Began to lose hair. Now, keep in mind, you know, what's funny is that people talk about black folk looking like apes. But you know, if you shamed an ape, an ape would be white. <laughs> no, don't believe me. Look up underneath the underarm. We're dealing with the sun. 
It's the sun that makes the hair black, but the hair that's black protects the skin that's pale. A gorilla's skin is pale. In fact, the only place where a gorilla is black is where there's no hair across the face up here. This is all science. This has nothing to do with superiority and inferiority. This has to do with your relationship to the sun. Come on, fam. Last time I was here, I was here in August. We was brown back then. Look at us now. We done lost that brownness, some of us. And no matter how brown you are, you get browner in the sun. And no matter how pale you may be, you become more pale in the winter. That's science. That's not personal. I'm not the complexion I was in August. And I'm not going to be this complexion next August. Neither are y'all. As long as y'all go out there and get some sun. But this is science. Australopithecus gracile is going to think better. When it thinks better, it's going to eat better. When it eats better, it's going to think better. But there's something happening. Have you ever been studying or working or doing things that pretty soon you start getting like a headache? It feels like your head hurts. Well, when you think, you know when you lift muscle, uh, when you lift weights, what you're doing is that you're pumping your muscles. But your muscles don't grow until you stop pumping iron. That's why you should always rest between exercise because that's when your muscles grow. Because you're, you're making them pump when you're exercising, but it's only when you stop that they actually grow. Well, when you think, you're doing the same thing with your brain. Your brain is like a muscle. And when you think, your brain is tensing constantly. Your neurons are making it tense. Well, what's going to happen is that this early human had a slanted forehead. Well, what's going to happen is that as this human is going to think better, is going to eat better, is going to think better, is going to eat better, this thinking on the brain is going to start to make it strong, and it's going to push this part of the brain from being slanted. It's going to push it forward. It's going to create what's known in the brain as a prefrontal cortex. Okay. Yes? Make sense? Yeah, we're talking about what we were talking about. <laughs> Med students? Um, uh, biology yeah, students? Okay. That's what's going on here. And the forehead is going from slanted to being pushed out so that something's going to happen, but i got to tell you some other things before I tell you what's going to happen. But this Brazil is going to be so advanced that it's going to move into another form of the human being but this form of the human being is going to be very different from the others because of this. I like watermelon. It's a perfect, perfect food. The most perfect food you can eat is watermelon. That's why they try to make fun of us when we be eating that watermelon. I love my watermelon. I don't care what anybody says. That's a perfect food. I eat watermelon, spit the seed out. Over time, I notice that the earth engulfs the seed. And where that seed was, all of a sudden, all these other watermelons come up. And I watch. Spit the seed down. And over time, in my head, I'm registering, wow. Where I spit that seed, remember, thinking better, eating better, thinking better, eating better, there's a cycle. And I'm looking, and I say, but well, wait a minute, if I should take my finger... And if I should put a hole in the ground and put the seed in, I'm going to cut down the amount of time it takes for that watermelon to pop up. And I'm going to test it out. I'm, I'm going to see if it's true. So now I, I put a hole in the ground with my finger and I put the seed in. Wow, yeah, it does. But pretty soon my finger starts to hurt. So I say, well... Let me go get a stick. And instead of always using my finger, I'm going to use a stick and I'm going to put holes in the ground. And I'm going to put seeds there. Wow, look at that. Cut down the time. I say, what happens like, okay, I can put one seed in, but suppose I take three sticks and I do that. Then I can get three more watermelons, so to speak or advancement of those watermelons. But when I do that, my back hurts.